We live in an age where every corner you turn, there's someone waiting in the shadows. With zipper lips or a switchblade dick. Where lies and manipulation are the dueling blades of the day. And you're looking to set yourself free? We'll keep walking right off the edge of that cliff. Because these are tales from the bottom down. And welcome to episode 2. That's the number two in French for any of you who are ignorant. And I'm your host, Deadbug. And I'm here with my co-host from Dark Topic, Jack Luna. Jack, how you doing, you no good, handsome son of a bitch? Yeah, you've never met me calling me handsome, but I, I appreciate you throwing that out there. I mean, fuck me, brother. I don't really mean it. What do you think I am, a homo? <laughs> Jack, that's just something you say in a podcast. It's called Podcast Etiquette. Think of me as True Crimes Oprah. <laughs> now, before we get started, I'm going to describe to these mooks what they're listening to. This, my oppressed citizens of YouTube, is the type of podcast you get over on Patreon. And what Patreon is, is a subscription-based service that for as low as one buck a month, you sign up, you get exclusive content, weekly podcasts, early releases, and all the stuff that was too hot for YouTube. You know the score. You also have access to a growing community of fans, including some very tasty ladies, who I personally give you my permission to sexually harass. But fear not, ladies, because I'm giving you a hall pass to go over there and do the same to the dudes, some of which are tasty. Unfortunately, not this guy. I've left links in the description, so go over and sign up for just a buck. Now I'm back, Jack. Sorry about that. I had to do a bit of a hard sell. Business before pleasure. It's okay. It's 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 not bad. I, I'm I'm looking forward to another episode of this. The I'm especially looking forward to uh, coming a little darker and a little more gruesome with 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 the tale that I have to tell. Me too, bruv. Uh, today, but more. I, I always love hearing you talk, man. I always love hearing you talk. So. You go ahead. Well, the feeling's mutual. You know, I was going to let you go first, but since you bigged your tail up so much, um, maybe I'll do it, or else it'll be like uh, Van Halen opening up for Journey. All right, you're not going to flip a coin this time? Nah, fuck it. You know me, I'd only cheat. <laughs> I mean, we know each other to be truthful by now. Uh, yeah, right, man. But, you know, if it makes you feel better being lied to, sure, let's flip a coin. <laughs> so how is everything, Jack? It's been a while. You doing good? It is good. You laying off the smokes and the booze? Started that vegan diet yet? Fuck no. No, I'm fucked. I'm gonna die. So we need, we need to hurry up. Okay, well maybe we should just do this whole series tonight. Just get it out of the way. So I can mourn your loss. Yeah. And I can just milk it. Although I don't want to milk you. <laughs> That's a whole different thing. Right. Yeah, we're not that close yet. Again, you gotta meet me first. Hmm? Exactly. And from what I know of you, you're the type of guy who likes to be wined and dined. Before you let someone milk you. <laughs> so let's put the tape in, press record, and get into this. This first tale, Jack, takes place in England. Or Hertfordshire, to be more precise. At a hospital called the Countess of Chester. Horrendous. Now I'm not a gambling man, Jack, but I'm going to gamble on this one. And say that you have no idea where I'm talking about. I don't. Well, Hertfordshire is what the English call part of the home counties, or southern England. All right. And this tale takes place in a prenatal ward, where babies are born, Jack. And in this prenatal ward, there is a higher percentage of baby illnesses and deaths than anywhere else. And these illnesses and deaths are unexplained. <sighs> and considering this is a place where hundreds of women a month come to have their babies, Jack, well, you get the idea. But there have been a couple of clues if you can call them that. One of the doctors said he was walking by the ward and he heard one of the babies shrieking. In his own words, Jack, he said it was an ungodly shriek that he didn't even know that a baby could make. Ugh, oh, pain. The baby's not just distressed by life and coming new to life, right, which babies are. Um, it's in pain, it sounds like. That's correct, Jack and probably a pain that goes beyond what any newborn would ever experience. A pain that went beyond pain. I guess best summed up by the physician who said it was unworldly. And when this physician, late at night, all by himself, ran in to the ward full of babies and up to the cot 
where the scream had come from, there was a little trickle of blood coming out of the baby, who was a male, mouth. And they brought this little trickle of blood to the lab, and they tested it. And there was nothing abnormal. It was just blood. And a couple of days later, this little boy passed. Now, in most situations like this, involving a baby's death, the parents are distraught, and they don't want an autopsy. And of course, it's their wish, and the hospital follows those wishes. But now, they can't investigate it any further. Any evidence there may have been is gone. And this continues. Babies in this prenatal ward keep getting ill. And between 2016 and 2017, there is an unusual infant mortality rate. Right. And this has never happened to this hospital, or at least in modern times. And between this period, there are 20 unexplained baby deaths. And there have been 17 life-threatening incidences with newborns wow. that are unexplained. They're baffled. So they have, they have um, at this particular place, I mean, there's a baseline for how many of these kids pass away and suddenly it's, there's been a large influx of deaths. Correct. And this is a well-respected hospital, Jack. And at any given time, there are 50 or 60 women in there expecting to leave with a healthy baby. And of course, in any situation in the hospital, life is part of death. And babies do die. But when they do, it's explainable. The term unexplained doesn't come into it, Jack. It's a breach. It's a stillbirth. Premature. But it's not an unexplained death. Right, SIDS, SIDS is one that they throw around, sudden infant death syndrome, right, which could be a pillow over the face or, or a child turning over wrong or whatever. I mean, it's, yeah. Go ahead. And of course, and that in itself can be explained as an unexplained death, but it's still a death with an explanation, if that makes sense. Yeah. And weird things are happening here. These babies are turning up blue, little trickles of blood coming out of their mouth, projectile vomiting unexplained incidences and i have to warn everybody this is a disturbing story that may affect women especially so please excuse yourself from this conversation if this is something that you may find distressing because i have kids and jack i know you have children and many of you out there listening will have children so this is going to be a disturbing tale one of the physicians had said in his statement that in his 30 years of working in prenatal care he had never seen a baby the color of one of the dead babies that they'd found. He had no explanation for it. None at all, Jack. Yeah, the, the, I don't know if I'm right on this, but the, the color that I envision is like a rot color. Like you, you would see uh, purplish and all that, but maybe it's got a blackish tone or a greenish tone to it. S something real nasty. And that's exactly what I thought too. I mean, I didn't want to focus on it too much, but you sort of envision something rotted. Yeah. So at this point, flags are being risen, and the hospital knows something's wrong. And their duty as caregivers is to investigate these abnormalities. And they have a team that starts looking into these deaths. And it's all very covert, right. but high priority covert, because they need to get to the bottom of this fast. But the problem here, Jack, is that they haven't done any autopsies because these parents haven't permitted it. Because let's face it, the last thing these parents are going to agree to in that moment of grief is to have their children cut up. Because this is just going to cause them more pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just want it to be over with and move, move on from it. I, I, I could pitch that. I don't know if that would be my decision myself. For many people, it's part of the healing process. Um, knowing the things that I know and where I assume this story is going. But I could see just kind of wanting to, to move on from it. Well, in one of these incidences, there's a young woman, and she has triplets. And two of these triplets, boys, died. And then the third became seriously ill, but he recovered, and then he became ill again. For seemingly no reason, and no one could explain it. And the physicians and nurses are baffled. And they've got these investigators creeping around the hospital looking for answers. And this investigation has to be on the down low. It can't be raising patients' suspicions. They can't bring this to the hospital. 
They can't walk around and start openly asking questions. Because if this news was to spread, get out in the open. Could you imagine being a woman and checking into the hospital, knowing that this is all going on and that you might not leave with your baby? And you just can't phone people up and ask about the dead kid. So this is no place for Kanda. And they're checking out where the hospital gets its baby food from, where medications used are obtained. They're investigating the parents' background. Were they smokers? Were they drug addicts? Background checks on the parents, the nurses, the doctors. Every aspect of the day-to-day -day goings on in this hospital and the things around it are now going under the microscope. They need to eliminate a checklist of reasons why these incidents have occurred. Yeah, yeah. And imagine, uh, Deadbug, like, uh, uh, having your, your baby pass away like that, but then on top of that being investigated immediately for it yourself and questioning all the things he possibly could have done wrong that likely led to his death. I mean, you, you are thinking it's got to be your fault in some way. Well, exactly, Jack. And the hospital, they have to to go about this in a timely manner, but they still have to show sensitivity. Hmm. And they need to stop this. They need to find out why. Right. Yeah. And they need to stop it from happening again. Hundreds of couples are coming into this hospital a month and having their newborn baby, and they're entrusting this hospital to deliver and care for that newborn baby. So the long and the short of it is they need to solve this mystery. So they start breaking down every one of the deaths and unexplained illnesses. When it happened, the shift that it happened on, who was on duty, who was not on duty, who had that day off, what formula was served that day. And Jack, one name kept coming up for each one of those babies' illnesses and deaths. And that name was Nurse Lucy Letby. So she, she's uh, around when all this happens each time? Bingo. Each and every time, Jack. Sometimes this woman would walk into the ward and be on duty for five minutes and a baby would die. Or take ill. Mm -hmm. All right. If she took a week off, nothing would happen, Jack. If a baby was ill and she took the next three days off, it would start to recover. But when she came back, it would get ill again. Can I can I tell you something here, real quick, Deadbug? Go ahead, Jack. Where I I I I it's it's bringing up this memory. I worked in group homes, and I ended up working in in a particular group home where they brought in babies. So these are babies taken by CIS away from their parents. So they've been, uh, the parents might be crackheads or, or they're, you know, they've been drinking and, and, the, and the baby is taken away from them because they can't care for the baby. So I'd be in these homes with all these babies. It was called the baby house. And a baby, like a month old, you'd walk up to it and it would flinch. The baby would flinch. That is not natural. Because it had been abused from the moment that it was born when it got brought back home. It was taken or, or it was just nervous in general of being alive because of whatever, maybe fetal alcohol syndrome or it's a cracked baby or whatever. Just a terrible place to be. I can only imagine. And that's not a normal thing. No. No, it's not. It's not. For a being so new to this world to flinch, I mean, that's horrible. But to continue... This nurse's name comes up again and again. But they can't find anything on her. She has an immaculate record. Right. She seems devoted. Mm -hmm. But they can't ignore that she is there for every one of these incidences. So they move in on this nurse because she is the source. When things go wrong, she is around. This is something that they cannot overlook. And whether she did it or not, well, that's yet to be determined. But Nurse Lucy Letts is the epicenter of the problem. The birthplace, if you will. So they start interviewing people that are working around this Lucy. Mm -hmm. Her co-workers and the patients at the time who were delivering their babies. And they talked to this woman who had the triplets which two of them had died. Now these triplets were all male, and this couple had been attempting to have a baby for a long time. And this mother said that she was bringing some milk into the ward for her son, 
and she heard him screaming. Screaming like he was screaming for help. And you think about it, these are newborns. This baby's like a couple of days old. Right. Screaming for help. And she walked in it she walked into the ward and there was Nurse Letby standing over the baby. And the mother screamed, What the fuck is going on? And Nurse Letby turned around calmly and smiled and said, Trust me. I'm a nurse. All right. Is she a nurse? <laughs> of course she's a nurse, Jack. Jesus, are you listening to the story? Okay. All right. All right. Trust me, I'm a nurse. These are caregivers. These are the people that we are supposed to fucking trust. Right. Right. Absolutely. And that ungodly scream that you said that the doctor had heard or whoever it was that had heard in the beginning, um, that's so haunting, you know, because babies do, again, I'll reiterate, like they do cry and they do scream, but to hear a scream of like help, like you can, you can sense that it's of help, help me. He said, he said he'd never heard it before. Wow. So this is a baby, and that baby ended up passing. So this is a baby saying, save me. I mean, this is, you know, this is a baby trying to survive. A baby. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, and this doctor, he said that it sent shivers down his spine. Yeah. So now they figure that something isn't right with this woman, this Nurse Letby. And they find out after each of the baby's deaths, immediately after, she went on to Facebook. She logged into her Facebook, and she followed the parents. Oh, to see their pain. Exact Amundo, Jack. Exact Amundo. <laughs> so these investigators, these eggheads, now see a pattern here. Nurse Letby starts a shift, a baby gets sick. Nurse Letby starts a shift, a baby's got blood coming out of his mouth. And this has all been reported as it's happened. But people, they just have, they just didn't put the pieces together. They were just documenting it, but they were never catching on because it was something out of the ordinary. Well, they don't want to believe it. I mean, a part of reporting is to make it, make it real and make yourself a part of something that you could be embarrassed by at some point and seem fucking nuts. And in the beginning, they would have been making excuses for her because no one wants to believe that one of their own would be taking the lives of these babies. So finally, with this overwhelming amount of evidence in front of them, they went to the police and they made an arrest. So in 2019, as she was preparing to go on the next shift, they arrested Lucy Letby at her home. And she was shocked. And of course she denied it. What's going on here? This is insane. I love babies. Are you crazy? I, I never did it. And she still denies it. She's on trial now. Right. And Jack, they started tearing apart her home, as you'd expect they would, with a fine-tooth comb. Right. To dig up evidence on this broad. They're removing computers, iPhones, iPads. But they didn't have to look that hard because they found a post-it note on her fridge. A post-it note that said, I did it. I killed those babies. And I hate myself. Because I'm a baby killer. A murderer. So this woman has basically put her confession on a post-it note on the fridge. <laughs> well, most people put a note up saying, eat the salmon, it's going to go bad in two days. This woman said, I I've been killing babies. Now, Jack, this is insane. Killing babies. Well, I mean, obviously, she, she, she did it. I guess I'll answer my own question there, I think, because I, I, I suddenly realized that to, to write it down is a way of um, letting out, letting it out, like your guilt. Like, so, so you write it down. I, I do this, not to that extreme, obviously. I'm not killing, killing fucking babies. But if I have a regret from my, from my life, from my past, and it's really starting to haunt me and bother me, I do have thousands of notes where I talk to myself through my notes and I kind of, it's like therapy. You're, you're, you're letting it out of yourself, like uh, bleeding the poison out of yourself. I agree with you totally. I mean, there's obviously some huge issues here of mm. self-loathing. And I mean, we all face it. I mean, we all wake up one day and you, you look in the mirror and you, you know, yeah, I fucking hate you. And you, you, you just face with things, you know? Right. 
But I suppose despite all this self-loathing, the main question here has got to be, why'd you kill these babies? Yeah, right in the first place. That is the question. Why in the first place? What what pushes her to... Well, that's the thing, Jack. No one knows. I mean, this trial is happening right now as we speak. And English law being what it is, it's just being released day to day. And there's a lot of things that the public just don't know yet. And one of those things is whether or not they have CCTV footage. Now, I would have thought if they'd had cameras, they would have nipped this in the bud a long time ago. Right. And if they don't, you gotta think, why not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a maternity ward, for Christ's sakes. People steal babies, they hurt them, and anything that happens, you got the footage. And you check it. Absolutely, man. Case closed. I mean, and nowadays you wonder how many people don't do the things that they could possibly do with, with their nature, right? Because they know they could be caught by a nanny cam or, or you know, or... or, or because, again, I've worked in group homes where there were no cameras. And I want, often wondered, are those flinches coming from something that the staff have done to them rather than the parents? Yeah. And, and if there were cameras in here, we could delete that one possible option because you're not going to fucking abuse somebody on camera. Well, exactly. And I'm not sure how the investigators know all these things because it's, it's being released day to day. It's in court as we speak. But prosecutors are saying that she will come back multiple times attempting to kill the same baby. It was almost as if, as if, if first you don't succeed, try, try again. And some of the ways that she did this was with a needle injecting air into their veins. Oh, God damn. Food into their veins, milk into their IV. Oh. And some of these methods were physical. She'd punch them, strangle them. Oh, push her hand down on certain points in their neck. It was almost as if she had no plan. It was just she'd go in and randomly do it. Yeah. The prosecutors say that she was just enjoying the process. Wow. I've heard that that injecting of air into the bloodstream doesn't always work on a fully developed human being. You know, like it, it, it won't, it'll cause you some pain, but on a smaller organism being a baby, it, 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 it probably works a whole hell of a lot better having less bloodstream to move through and the little bubble popping through it probably gets there quicker you know um, and that pain that you talk that scream that you're talking about so that's how she's doing it she she's injecting air and injecting other shit as well as medication just trying to give them the good old-fashioned drug overdose but yeah from what I read most of it seems to be injecting foreign substances into these tiny babies Jesus and they figure it was through the sole of the feet, so it couldn't be detected. Oof. And the thing is, Jack, is she didn't kill all of these babies. I mean, she's left a lot of them vegetables, permanent brain damage. I mean, this bitch was one nasty piece of work. It don't surprise me, Jack, that she was single. Okay. Um, so you, do you have any information? You asked the question, I think, already, so you may not. And it sounds like a fairly recent case. Well, yeah. It's in court now. Do you have any information, the reasoning why she would do such a thing? You know, there's there's no information. There's always these theories about these caregivers and, you know, lifesavers of why they do it and their angels of mercy and whatnot. But these kids were healthy babies. And with other cases, like that Harold Shipman who was wiping out all those old people, it's exactly that. They're old people. So you can think, oh, I'm, I'm giving them a gentle, nice death, a nice send-off. But this truly is a day-to-day -day story. It's just drip feeding coming out, and we just have to wait and see. And the bizarre thing, even with all this evidence, or supposed evidence, we don't know because it's just coming out now, the post had noticed certainly damning. And this, but this nurse is still denying it. She's still saying that she's innocent of these crimes. I wonder what it is. I really do, because I often, like, when, whenever I cover cases, I can, to a certain part of like, my darkness, like, I could go pretty dark with myself, uh, way further beyond what I'm capable of, but I can imagine. Um, when it comes to something like this, like, doing this to a baby, I, my mind is blank on it. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like I mentioned with that doctor, the English doctor, Harold Shipman. He were killing all those old people. Yes. And he, he, and you know, a lot of people said it, what he was doing was was like a millionaire's death. He was giving them a millionaire's death. These people were old. They were they were right, whiny old bitches. He just put them out of the fucking misery. And he, he you know, he, he did he did it in a way where they didn't have to be shitting themselves and fucking, you know, dragging their sorry ass around the home. So that's where they get that is a millionaire's death. So he could justify it. 
Yeah. That he cared for these people. He was giving a compassionate death. But uh, I, there's just no justification here. These kids weren't ill. These kids weren't, you know, they didn't have cancer. They didn't have any illnesses to speak of. Hey, and this woman looks like your typical sort of English broad. You know, she's got the blonde hair, the goofy teeth, you know, stupid look on her face, you know, right. just smiling and, you know, but it, it, not in a negative way. But she just looks like a, your, your average sort of English <laughs> Gotcha. Woman, yeah. you know, I mean, she's, she, she's no supermodel or anything, but I mean, she just, she has got a big smile on her face and she's, you know, uh, holding up baby grows and stuff. She looks like uh, she, she, uh, likes being a nurse, but clearly she likes a job for all the wrong reasons, Jack. Right. I mean, standing over a baby as a nurse and you've gotten into the profession to help people, but you're standing there and injecting a fucking, uh, bubble of air into a screaming fucking babies padded the pad of their foot or you know anyway like i i just i just can't put my head there and i usually can when it comes to a serial killer like climbing in a window and and all that not that i you know fucking would do it or whatever but i but i can imagine um with that i just i just don't see the the pay the payout um other than obviously power right playing god what's the buzz here What's the buzz? And the weird thing is when she started doing this, she was a young woman, 29. And the fact that she's denying it still, when they've got this postage note, they see her surfing on Facebook, looking at the family's grieving. I mean, the prosecutors, they must have a lot of evidence and she must know that evidence. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if she has children herself. No, no children, no boyfriend. Uh, they said she was a woman dedicated to her work. All right. Yeah, you wonder. You wonder how how the mind works. If it, it, we'll have to see how it plays out. But if you can't have children, say, and it's like uh, a jealousy thing, or like uh, like a payback thing to 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 God, even if you believe in such things, like just like you know, if I can't have it, nobody can. And I'm just, you know, throwing shit out there. No, I think that's an interesting theory that never crossed my mind. Maybe she can't have kids. And like you said, if, if I can't have them, nobody can. She's got sawdust in her womb. You wonder, man. That's a rough one. And interesting. It's, it's, happened, it's happened over time. I mean, we know it like a ton of stories. Um, but uh, this, this, this is a recent one. I never heard of it before. Well, like I said, it's all coming out now. And it's funny thing about, you know, baby deaths and all that. I mean, it's one, not one of those things that uh, carries well on the 6 o'clock news. So, you know, uh, limited information is coming out. But, I mean, it's chilling. When that woman testified, when the mother testified that she'd heard her son screaming and she screamed to the nurse what she was doing and uh, Nurse Letts turned around and smiled and said, trust me, I'm a nurse. I mean, that's some that's something out of a goddamn horror movie. It is. A horror movie, yeah, it is, man. And there it is. Fuck. You know, and, and you and I both having kids, I, I remember being in the hospital when my child was born, and um, my one son was born with a call over his head, and it's a very rare thing, like uh, 1 in 18,000 chance, right? And he comes out with the sack still around his head, and they're calling everybody into the room, and they're very fascinated by it. And I was looking at those nurses, and I was like, Man, so many of you are just fascinated by the process and, you know, uh, seeing it on a very clinical level. Um, where's the humanity in, in some of them? You know, I was like, can we cut that fucking sack open and get the baby out for fuck's sake? Yeah. And, but they're just like so fascinated, right, with the medical aspect to it. The, cl the clinical side of it opposed to the emotional side, yeah. Y yeah, right. And any of us, you know, you see something enough times and... You're around something enough, I guess the magic of it kind of wears off. Anyways, I'm not sure where I'm going with that at all because it's all magic when it comes to babies. Um, yeah. This bitch, dude. This 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 girl, man. Unbelievable. So there you go. It's still unfolding, and uh, we can do an update on it later as more info comes out. All right. So what do you got for me, Jack? Anything uh, to make it worthwhile? I mean, getting out of bed? <sighs> it's not good. It's real bad. Well, good. This ain't the fucking Disney Channel, brother. Cough it up. Don't be shy. <laughs> I've had a, a few uh, friends of mine that I've turned on to you who said you have a Jersey accent. And I'm like, he does not have a fucking Jersey accent from New Jersey. You know? Huh. Yeah, I don't get that either. Have you heard that? I have heard that. Uh, Jersey, and I also heard Boston. Right. <laughs> Which I don't get either. And I also heard 
New York a lot, which I guess I can kind of get because uh, I started my career there and lived there. Right. And a lot of people in the comments section say that I'm English and that I'm an Englishman imitating an American. <laughs> Which is fucked up. <laughs> That's a good way to put Which it. Which always pisses me off because I think if you knew me, you, you know, I mean, you knew I, I, you know, I wouldn't put that much effort into something. Besides, it's much easier to speak in your own accent opposed to imitate another. Yeah. So in conclusion, although I may have an amalgamation of accents, certainly not Jersey. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I think of it. And when I tell those people, I say the, the guy is a world traveler and he's picked up these things along the way. And what you're catching is an amalgamation of everything he's been through, and it's coming through in the way that he speaks. I I haven't even been to Jersey, so. When I first met you, when we started talking, I was like, wow, he is dead bug, right? I said that to you. And and now I realize, you know, he's not a character. He is this guy and, and a very original person, clearly not from fucking New Jersey. Let's put those slanderous lies and unfounded rumors to rest, Jack. All right, well, there is another Jersey, um, and I'm about to talk about it. It's a, it's a, it's a small island the French coast of Normandy, um, just across the English Channel. Are you aware of this, Deadbug? Do you know where Jersey is? Uh, I know where it is. It's in the English Channel, and I know it's kind of English, but not really English. It's sort of gone back and forth to different countries throughout history, like the Dutch and the French. And the Germans occupied it in World War II, and the English didn't defend it because it held no strategic value, apparently. I mean, and that's about as much as I know. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's more, it's closer to the French coast. I mean, it's just off of Normandy. Although they do use English money. I know that much. They use the English pound there instead of the frog dollar. Absolutely. You got it. Yeah. And I guess they still hold the rights to everything there. The same way they do with Canada. It's kind of like a part of the monarchy but they, they have no real control over it there's there's a history there so my story is about the beast of jersey it has a heavy british french influence it's a very small island but it is its own country it's it's nine miles long and five miles wide uh for you dead bug it's smaller than greater london wow so not much to it it's just kind of like out i i islands creep me out all day, you know, they're these days they're tourist attractions. You know, they probably got really nice coasts and beaches and and all that, and and uh, they 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 depend on tourism. But at night, these islands that exist out there in the ocean or in you know like outside the English Channel in this situation are so fucking creepy to me. They can see the lights of of France and and maybe on a clear day for fucking England. I'm not sure. But they're just, they're like a little boat, you know, with a bunch of people on it sitting out there and nobody really knows what's going on out there. And that was the case for quite some time in the 50s, um, which is where our story is going to take place. These days, everyone's hyper aware of it and they, they do travel there from England quite a bit and from France and all around the world. But back when my story takes place, um, the population was probably around 50,000. Today, it's around 100,000. And we're headed back to 1957 when the island wasn't so touristy. It's a literal dot on the map. It is today, too, but I mean. And um, it's a creepy place, man. It's a very creepy place. It would have been near pitch black at night. And it's just surrounded by water. And like I've already said, it you could see the lights of France, possibly from England. Um, and a so-called beast, a boogeyman, bogeyman, some say, was on a serial raping spree on this small island. And this raper would terrorize the Jersey people on this island called Jersey. He would terrorize it for over a decade. It started with women being snatched from bus stops at night a small man wearing an insane costume, sneaking up from behind them, throwing a noose over their necks, and dragging them out into the darkness of fields to brutally rape them. The attacks were happening a couple times a year, and with the island being so small, word spread fast on these attacks, and yet the beast terrorized the island consistently for almost 15 years. This attacker would wear a mask similar to that of Michael Myers 
though to me it's even creepier than the Michael Myers mask. You're familiar, obviously, with that mask, Deadbug. Yeah, I am. Very creepy. When I first saw it years ago, I thought it reminded me of Michael Myers. But then way creepier, like creepy times infinity. R yeah, yeah, even creepier. Um, the Michael Myers mask actually uh, originally, and I learned this from Kent, our mutual friend, is that it was a William Shatner mask that was kind of like melted in certain ways to, to make it look a, a lot more creepier and, and less human. That's what the original Michael Myers mask is, is a William Shatner mask. I never knew that. Captain Kirk, the great ladies man, does he know about this? <laughs> He's probably proud of it. I don't, I don't know. He looks like he's wearing a mask these days. You know, now that we mention him, I'm, I'm going to go on a limb here, Deadbug, and tell you that I bet you fucking he dies. There, There is um, a Deadpool that I'm involved in. I'm actually one of the people that they think is going to die at some point. Somebody hit me to it, and uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm a little worried that we just mentioned him right there. What, because you got a bet on it? I want in on that action. Pe pe yeah, people have bets on me, too. It, apparently someone told me about that. Well, let's make sure we get this series done first and warn me so I can get in on it. Yeah. He uh, he wears this Michael Myers-type mask. It's got, like, this this fake hair and all in it. It's, it appears to have fake eyebrows on it, too. Um, he's wearing an outfit you might see on a scarecrow, uh, though the coat, the coat that he wears is a dark rubber raincoat with one inch nails poking from the fabric around the wrists um, and it's all over it like these these little nails sticking out of it is what these women who are being dragged out into the fucking fields they have a lot of tomato fields out there uh, at the time in Jersey and uh, you can just rip he's well you can't or I can't but like he did rip women with this noose around their neck out into the fields and brutally rape them wearing this intensely scary outfit. This fucked up, scary. Fucked the beast, up. oh, very, in such a small island, right? I mean, like at this time, the population is around fifty thousand, and uh, everybody's aware of it. So this goes on for years. Like I said, fifteen years, and um, they're aged. 15 to the 30s when he starts preying on the women that he's grabbing for the bus stops. But then at some point in the early 60s, the beast starts after children, girls and boys climbing in windows to snatch the little ones, slapping a wool gloved hand over their mouths when they're in bed and whispering in their ear in an Irish accent. That makes it even creepier. Fucking Irish. I hate them. <laughs> Sorry, that's a personal bias. Continue with your story. All right. So he's whispering in this fucking Irish accent. He's telling them to shut the fuck up while he's grabbing these eight-year-olds, these 12-year-olds, these girls, these boys. Now he's upped the ante, you know. He's he's doing probably what he really wants to do. Is um, It's maybe not even just about... Here's a huh, something I shouldn't even get into, but a, a misconception about uh, some fucking pedophiles is that they're uber attracted just to children I think what they're attracted to is ultimate innocence and stealing as much pureness as they possibly can and in this case he's moved from girls at the bus stops to climbing directly in windows and, and if ever you know in places like Jersey Island and everywhere in the world even today but especially back then before street lights turned on and you had cops rolling around the streets we all talked about the boogeyman right the bogeyman whatever you want to fucking the way you want to say it a werewolf fucking vampires right coming to get you in the night in jersey island at this time through the 60s early 50s all the way up until the early 70s there was a legit an actual boogeyman and his name was the beast of jersey he twice a year sometimes three times would climb into a home, grab a child, drag them out into the woods with a rope around their neck and brutally rape them before he would bring them back to their home or leave them in the field and uh, tell them not to say a word or kill their whole family. Now, Jack, did this joker always operate at night under the cover of darkness? Yes. 
Absolutely, man. Between uh, 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., usually on weekends. And uh, for the people of Jersey, for for this period of time, they just knew he was going to snatch a few. They also knew that he was probably one of them because it's not like you're taking a fucking boat in and going in and do this shit. He's he's on the island. Yeah, because this isn't an e- this isn't an easy easily accessible island, especially in this time period. The victims would be too traumatized to keep it a secret, as he demanded of them to keep it a secret. And the legend of the Jersey Beast grew through the '60s. Were there any witnesses towards this, except for the immediate victims? There, there was a home invasion where a mother fought off the beast. He just walked right in the fucking door. As a 46-year-old woman, her daughter is 14 years old in the home, and she screams at this beast who's wearing this Michael Myers mask and this fucking rubber suit uh, with nails all over it. Let's keep in mind that during this period, there was no Michael Myers. There were no Halloween masks. So, I mean, this guy is like, this is the original. I mean, this this is, this is no one's ever, no one's ever seen anything like this. So it's not like when you saw him, you thought, this guy looks like Michael Myers. I mean, this is like, what the fuck is that? Very good point. Very good point, man. Because the first time I saw Michael Myers in the in the Halloween movies, I was like, "Fuck, that's the scariest thing I've ever seen." But to but to see it in reality, when you have no preface for it, like it's you've never even seen it in the movies or anything like that. I mean, this guy just waltzes into your house with a inhuman mask on and nails all over him and starts trying to grab everybody. He's not saying a word. Hmm. You see those TikTok videos, they still do those TikTok videos now where someone drives around in a car wearing a Michael Myers video and he looks at people and he scares the shit out of people. So this is even now, with this being becoming a cultural almost norm that people know who Michael Myers is, it still scares the shit out of people. So you can imagine the effect back then when this person this person created that look is doing it. It's funny you mention that because I was just watching it. I swear a couple of nights ago with my son and he couldn't stop laughing my four-year-old about the michael myers mask looking at people because he's dressed as michael myers for halloween my son walks around the house with a michael myers mask on and doesn't say a fucking word the same kid who was in the the call with the thing over his face and he's a one in eighteen thousand. he's like i'm a warlock he has a silver streak in his hair um <laughs> but fuck dude he had a legitimate silver streak in his hair dead bug like he, he like it, it's it's natural um, he's like a little warlock and he walks around the house with a Michael Myers mask just breathing and uh, he thinks that's so funny in those TikTok videos you just mentioned anyways so <laughs> oh, oh, Charlie man he's a, he's a hell of a kid so the the um, the guy walks into the house the beast of Jersey he walks into this house doing this home invasion and the mother fucking freaks and he's a little guy right so she's able to she's able to fight him off and and he kind of backs off to the resistance. She runs for a phone, picks it up, and realizes that he's cut the phone line. So she drops the phone, and she screams up to her um, 14-year-old, who's on the, the, the top floor, get in your room, lock the door. And then she runs out of the house, trying to go for help. She finally finds help. And brings... And I'm guessing where this family lives, help isn't just around the corner. No, that's right. We're talking like 1961 on a fucking island called Jersey in the middle of a goddamn nowhere. And uh, she runs out into the darkness just trying to find neighbors to come and help her with the situation that, you know, has come rushing through her door in the form of the Beast of Jersey. And when she finally finds the help and she knows that she's told her daughter to go and, you know, go into her room, she's left her daughter there. She comes back into the house with these, with these other people. And this, the house is silent, and they go up to her daughter's bedroom, and they find her bound uh, with rope. Her hands are all tied up, and she's uh, naked from the waist down, and she's been raped, and she's, she's crying her eyes out. And he's gone. In that short of a time, he's gone. Yeah, he's gone. Well, see, that's something I kind of struggle with, like how short of a time would it be? And, and, and you mentioned, like, you know, how long would it take? Maybe it took half an hour, right? Well, exactly. I mean, these houses aren't exactly in the suburbs. And especially with the time period, it was probably about a 25-minute run to the next house. Right. And the balls on this fucking guy to have just dealt with that interaction with the mother and she goes running out screaming for help to take the time to bind this 14-year-old who, he, you know, I don't know if he kicked in the fucking door in her room, but he did rape her. 
He did rape her and then he left. He didn't kill her. For me, Jack, this is insane. I mean, I can't even get a boner if the music's playing too loud. And this guy, knowing that the mother's running for help, he's he's g getting balls deep. It's just, for me, it's just, uh, this guy's got ice running through his veins. It, it, I mean, it's another good point, Deadbug, because, like, the pressure, the, the fucking pressure, knowing that the you're about to be caught, likely, and, and it, it's just, it's otherworldly um, evil. You know, he's he's dedicated to the task, and he and he, he completes it, and, and he gets out before they come. And I'm guessing he did come. In another instance, I mean, and there are plenty, but I just want to mention the worst ones. An eight-year-old boy was dragged out of his bedroom, through a window, to a field. So this guy liked ass pussy as well. Like it wasn't just girls; it was dudes. Oh yeah, no, it was it was little boys too. Yeah, yeah, it was anything. It, yes, it was it was just preying on innocence. So this Joker got balls deep. And whatever came along. Whatever. As long as he was, and we'll find, serving the dark side. Um, this this beast of Jersey is 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 attempting to serve the dark side. And uh, dragging an eight-year-old boy out to a field and, and raping him. Uh, in this instance, he finishes the rape. Uh, terrifying this child. Do you imagine being an eight-year-old boy being dragged by the neck with a fucking noose over it, over your, over your, <laughs> wrapped around your neck, out your window, by a man dressed the way that I've already described, into a field, and then being raped. And, th and this but, guy's oh, probably walking around with a big boner as well. Probably. I mean, he's five six, you know. So he. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying in a roundabout way is th the victim knows what's coming. They know what he's going to give them. You know, it's weird that he never crossed a line into killing someone. Because, I mean, this sounds like someone almost almost you would have thought it would have evolved into murder, but it didn't. Yeah, it, it, uh, allegedly it didn't. There there are some murders that do happen on the island that later on they start to wonder, was he the one who did them? Because they do find bodies in fields. Um, and later on they're, they're wondering if he had gone that far. But it appears that he wants his legend to kind of, you know fester or evolve on the island and everyone doesn't know what's up because with this eight-year-old boy after he finishes fucking terrorizing him and brutally raping an eight-year-old boy he brings him back to the house and leaves him on the front porch that is horrific nightmare inducing you right so the parents find him there the parents just find the boy crying on the front porch <sighs> Anyways, uh, an actual monster. He's having his way with the island. He's ruling it for years. 30,000 people are questioned, dead bug. Almost half the population. And that means, because I looked into the population at the time, it was about 50-50. So every single man on this island was questioned. And so that means that they, they question the actual beast at some point in time, but they just can't decipher who he actually is. So had they actually ever questioned this individual? Mm hmm And they, did. they had questioned him? They did. Wow. They did. Any record of what ha went down in that interview or no? No, I have no record on that. But I know that he was questioned multiple times, actually, from, from what I, I think it was four times that, the, that they ended up speaking to him. But I'll get into who he is and, and the reasons maybe why that he was passed over. Because I guess for something like this, it would have to be a process of elimination. You know, this person was here, this person this person worked close to that proximity, it was impossible to travel there. Cutting things out, okay, we got this, we're going to move this to the side. Uh, uh, eliminating things, eliminating certain people, and that's what they would have been doing, just talking to people. We're going to eliminate this person. We're going Because back then, there would have no, there wouldn't have been the forensics like they have the FBI behavioral science teams. And there was none of that. It was just it was just all the f fashion detective work. Okay, I got a feeling about this guy. Where were you here? Do you, how close did you live to this proximity? What time did you knock off work? It would have been that sort of thing. And I mean, to interview that many people, I mean, the the note taking and the information would have have to been would have had had to been precise and intricate. Absolutely. And the the one man that you're looking for has an advantage over every. 29,999 men that you interview in knowing that they're probably coming and he's prepared more so with an alibi than the rest of them would be. So this guy is probably calm as a cucumber and he's ready for the cops. A suspect does emerge. 
His name is Alphonse Le Gastelois. Uh, he's a loner who likes to take night walks and often wore a raincoat, which is one of the things that, you know, many of them said that the guy was wearing a rubber raincoat. A lot of people so wear... So this this guy this this guy's name yeah on those islands because it's windy and it's wet because it's yes. an island right it, it's it it be almost constantly wet so you said this guy's name it was Alphonse was it French or something <laughs> uh, it sounds fucking I don't yeah so I still don't know why it's this frog guy because it's an island it's wet and there are gonna be a lot of people Jack walking around with raincoats you know because it's raining they do but they don't all walk around at night. And and they're not all loners, and they're not all living in a cottage by themselves. Yeah, I mean, I guess you got a good point there. So this guy was weird. He was, and he was out there often, just fucking with his hands stuffed in his pockets. He doesn't have nails all over him, um, nails that that cut many of the victims as they tried to struggle. Um, the reason why there were nails on the coat is, it should be obvious, but um, it wasn't initially to me. Was that when the victim started to struggle? They would be cut up by all these nails on the costume that the that the rapist was wearing, and they would submit easier. That's evil. Yeah. So Alphonse Le Gastelois, I'm fucking that name for sure. He is is brought in because he's doing these night walks, and he's he's out there often when this is happening. Again, this is a very small island, so anybody out at any given time, I mean, you're you're very much so a suspect. And a lot of people don't like Alphonse because he doesn't have kids and, and a wife and all that. He's just a creep that's in his cottage to, to most of them. And of course it's Alphonse. And um, the Jersey people are taking no chances once he becomes a suspect. And they burn his cottage down. Jesus, these people on these small islands, uh, they don't mess around. Yeah, they, they want to lynch him. And even though the, the investigators find that there's no real evidence that he is this uh beast they run him off the island they fucking literally push him off the island and he flees well that's sort of that that's that sort of mob justice that sort of mob justice isn't totally unusual i mean it's not unheard of mm. Mm. but remember we're talking about the, the 60s and we're also talking about a place that's probably decades behind um, so we're almost like in the 1930s mindset where they used to fucking lynch people that they, they assumed were dicking around with children and stuff. They would just go to the house, burn their house down, and, and hang them from a tree, right? Without a doubt. Mob rules, as they say, which is also a good Sabbath album. Yes. Yeah, so nobody's guilty of it, and we got rid of the problem. And the Jersey people are, are actually... <laughs> Even though that they're capable of doing this and they'll, they'll stand together, they're not murderous. And they don't kill him. They just push him off the island. He goes to a smaller island, uh, one that's basically deserted. And he has to live off the land for the next 10, 12 years until the real beast is eventually caught. He survives, Alfonso does, uh, by catching lobsters. And he becomes a mythical creature of sorts on this island. A suspected woman and child rapist exiled to a deserted island. And he's like this this creature out there that they're worried will come back. But the attacks continue after he's gone. So there's question, right? They're like, okay, is he like a mythical beast? Can he come here in spirit and continue to do this kind of shit? There's, there's all these strange, you imagine how, how wild the feelings must be amongst the people, right? Cause the, it continues. And anyways, so I'll, I want to share with you, a, cons a consistent description of the Beast of Jersey that's shared uh, by his victims. So his MO and some description is that he always attacked at night between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., usually on weekends, like I said. He had to have been extremely familiar with the island, especially the eastern side where most of it happened. It seemed like he could just disappear into the, into the night and likely he was going back to his home. Victims felt that he was around 40 to 45 years of age. He was around five foot six tall. He had a medium build. Like I've said, he was softly spoken, had an Irish accent. They think he had a mustache for some reason. I'm not sure. Oh, I know why. 
So when he initially started grabbing the women from the bus stops, he did not wear the mask at that time. He was just a man with a mustache that they remembered and the mustache brushing against them. These rapes, you see, you could just say rape. You could just say brutal rape. But when you get down to the details, you got a guy's face rubbing up against them, going down on them, chewing on their nipples, all this fucked up shit. The, <laughs> the devil is, is truly in the details and all this, and, and you don't often get them, but they know that he has a mustache from, from these early rapes. Yeah, yeah. He gives off a distinct musty smell, and uh, his face is always covered with a mask, obviously. So very similar to Kent when he goes out for chicken wings. <laughs> exactly like Kent. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being no, silly. You're... But so, so, but so, but so, he, so he has an aroma about him. But they, does it? Does he stink, or are we just talking about a musk? Mm. We're talking about musty. So if you ever left something uh, in a closet too long, and it's a little bit damp. You know, the, that 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 oh, the smell of a basement, the smell of a damp basement is is truly what it is. Um, I fucked up here for a. Oh, I fucked up here for a while, uh, not really recognizing the lingo. Um, it is said that he always carried a torch. So in my mind, I thought he had an actual torch, you know? Oh, uh, opposed, to a, opposed to a flashlight, yes. which is what English people call. Right. So you're thinking of those old days with Frankenstein. I did. Where they're chasing him, a torch, which is even scarier. I thought that's what it was. And I was like, how's this guy getting away with like this, this flame off of his <laughs> torch walking around the goddamn island? Dragging kids by a noose. You think someone? You think someone would notice them? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. But but what it actually is is a flashlight with uh, tape on it to emit a very uh, precise beam coming out of it, so it doesn't flash out in its periphery of of the the flashlight itself. Right? It's very direct beam. I've I've heard I've heard that a couple of times, and I'm not a, a torch or flashlight mm -hmm. expert, but there's been a couple of crimes where the perpetrator. I think it was one of the ones was the Girl Scout murders. Yeah. Yes. Where those Girl Scouts were murdered, I they that. found a, yeah. a a torch light. Did you? Yeah, they fooled. If you remember, you did too. They, I covered it as well. Yeah, I do. Yeah, they have a t they had a torch or a flashlight with tape over with um, just a little small hole made made so yes. it can very precisely direct the so you don't get a lot of peripheral light just the very direct. Exactly, man. And and I'll admit to you, Dead Bug, that the reason why I covered that was because I watched your video on it. I used to steal from you all the time, man. I used to fucking take your cases and fucking make them my own. And, and I've told you that before, but that's one that I did, that I did get from you. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. cool, cool, yeah. cool. Well, like, at, le at least you make it your own opposed to the people who steal from me and don't <laughs> give me credit and just, just copy what I do. So, <laughs> I've seen but that so, thing. so this is. So <laughs> <laughs> so, th so this guy basically is walking around with a flashlight mm -hmm. or torch, as the English call it, with a, with a little hole cut out. So that's how manipulative yeah. and smart he is. Yes, and well thought out ahead of time, right? He's very, I mean, he's doing this for 14 years almost. Like, so um, a few other things. He'd enter the house via a bedroom window. Uh, the victims would be blindfolded and tied up with a rope placed around their necks. Um, they'd be taken to a field, sexually assaulted, returned to the home in almost every attack. Um, and the, the attacker would talk constantly during his attacks. Like, almost like he's justifying it to himself. Or, or not even that. He's speaking to something else, it seems to them. Um, but, but beyond that, he's throwing out red herrings so that they will share this shit with the investigators. So he's mentioning that he has a deceased mother. Uh, he can't wait to have a cigarette. And it turns out that this guy doesn't actually smoke cigarettes, you know, um, just throwing things out there that they will share with investigators to lead them to types that are not unlike himself. Hmm. In some, in some ways he thinks he's clever, but I think they would have caught on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, pretty, 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 they would have caught on pretty early. This guy's throwing out red herrings. You'd hope so. You'd hope so. Um, and he also continuously claims to have killed someone before, so he will kill them. And there's no evidence that he ever killed anybody. All right, so uh, the beast had been successfully hunting the island of Jersey for so long that fearing him just became a part of life. There was a monster among them. He'd feed each year on the women and children. It was just the way it was. You know, we know we're gonna lose a few to, to rape. 
um, to that type of trauma every year and uh, just lock your windows, check your kids as much as you can, but it's going to happen and it does. And then, and, and uh, probably probably back then, sorry to cut you off, no, uh, Jack, but probably back then, because we haven't touched upon the police. I mean, probably back then, there there wasn't an extensive police force. I mean, there's probably no. a barracks with maybe about eight eight guys or something that work in shifts, if that. Absolutely. That's probably being generous. Yes, but by the time like the the late sixties goes, like I mean, they're fucking tired of this at a certain point, right? And Scotland Yard, I don't understand all that shit, but like. Uh, is Scotland Yard like f- <laughs> the FBI of of the United Kingdom or something like that? Yeah, I mean, there there there's the sort of the big shots. There's the generally the Met, and then there's Scotland Yard. Less so now, but once upon a time, that was the you know, oh gosh, Scotland Yard. Or I'm getting the feeling it was very local, kind of like in America where you'd be going through like Tennessee of the old days. You'd be going through those little towns. And you'd have a little, you know, sheriff who, who probably just got hired. He's got no training. A sheriff and his deputy, kind of like Opie and, uh, not, you know, like uh, Mayberry, Andy and Mary Mayberry and uh, that. But no, very similar to that. So I'm getting the feeling back then it was for something like Jersey. It was probably they just hired some guy with no real training. So they're used to people stealing cows and stuff. I mean, murder probably never, never has come into the equation. Right, right. They do try to, to come in and give them some tips and all that. But I mean... You can't, it's only happening twice a year. He's amongst them, they know this, and they just try to give them some tips or whatever and, 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 and be very diligent about any opportunity to go after something that looks suspicious is all they've given them. So finally uh, in 1971, so it began in, in 57, we're talking about 14 years into this shit, a man is in a vehicle seen driving erratically through Jersey around, I think it's like 1 a.m. And uh, a cop, a Jersey cop, comes up behind him and tries to pull him over, and a chase ensues. They chase him with their vehicle. Um, They end up doing some type of maneuver that causes them both to crash, totaling both vehicles. And incredibly, like, the officers are just fine and so is the man in the vehicle they've been tailing and and just crashed and he goes running out into a tomato field and he's dressed as the beast that they've been searching for (laughs) you know he's fucking got the outfit on and he's running into the field man an officer this is like horror (laughs) horror film stuff yeah they catch up to him in the field they tackle him and his clothing has nails all over it, screws sewn into it. It leaves marks on the officer, not unlike the marks left on victims who tried to struggle with the beast over the last 14 years. And speaking of marks, there are red marks all over this man's face when they put their own torch into his face, right? And they're like, what the fuck's up with all these marks on this guy? And he explains, hey, listen, I just came back from an orgy where we wear masks. And I had a mask taped to my face that, that I ripped off, you know, there. And uh, I just didn't want to be. Uh, the reason why I, why I, I jet, why, why I took off on you guys is because I just came back from this orgy, and I don't want to be found out uh, for cheating on my wife at this orgy. Uh, uh, and <laughs> they okay. push him for his identification, and he has it. His name is Edward Paisnell. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It looks. It looks. Yeah. It looks. It looks correct to me. P a i s n e l. Yeah. Fair enough. Close enough. Uh, he's a local contractor in his mid-40s, a productive and well-liked citizen, a husband, a father, maybe known as a bit of a philanthropist. There's there's some things that he's doing in the community I'll get to in a moment. Uh, but the car that he's in, it turns up as stolen later, they find out. Um, he's rambling on in his Irish accent, and it doesn't take the cop long to handcuff him. They're like, fuck this guy. This is the nightmare. This is... The other cop's like, there's a mask in here. It's the fucking, it's, it's the guy. Um, the, the cops themselves have had nightmares about this guy. They've probably grown up knowing about this entity that's amongst them, right? And they finally, they they, they have him. And uh, it turns out this is the beast. It's, you know, and everyone on the island, they'd already suspected that he'd been living amongst them in, in plain sight. Uh, there's not much option on this island. It's not like he ferried in and out of, for rape, like I mentioned earlier. Um, 
the look of Edward pays no. He is ugly as shit. I don't know if you can see him now, dead bug, but he's scary with the mask off. Right? Yeah, he's fucked up looking. He's got those half-lidded eyes, that little pencil-thin mustache, and he's like got a fucking face like a burn victim or something. Not a not a pleasant-looking fellow. He wouldn't do well on Tinder. You're describing him look, exactly. He's what you'd expect the pedophile rapist to look like. I haven't described his rat face with the little mustache over a curled lip, pasty skin, hooded eyelids over mean, beady eyes. Bingo. He ain't no male model. So... It turns out that uh, he'd been in a sham of a marriage and lived in a built-on section of his home. Uh, They say it's an annex section of his home uh, where no one was allowed to enter. When detectives search the beast's lair, as they believe him to be, they discover a secret room that holds an altar. Uh, They also describe a library full of books on the occult and black magic. There were duplicate costume pieces raincoats studded with nails there were wigs there were masks with uh, fake eyebrows laying beside them to paste on the guy liked to paste on these fake eyebrows on the mask for some fucking reason uh the room was filled well you've seen his pictures maybe because he had no eyebrows (laughs) right yeah he didn't want to double down um (laughs) the room the room that they find has uh, in in within this annex section of his house and no one was allowed in until they find this musty smelling room and it's the musty smell that all the victims had been smelling off of him okay there is a, a camera with photos of homes he'd been surveilling and all the books that they find show an obsession with medieval torture um, and witchcraft and black magic, all that. There are medieval wooden weapons decorating the walls. Edward Paisnell admits an obsession with the dark arts and dark history. It's learned he has an obsession with Gilles de Rays, and I'm fucking that name up bad. I think it's Gilles de Rays. He's, he's, he's He's the infamous 15th century French child serial killer, a leader of the French army who'd abused his position of power and raped and killed likely hundreds of children. Like they, Many believe he's the first actual serial killer. Do you know who I'm talking about, Dead Bug? Uh, I mean, it, it sounds kind of familiar. Yeah, I just kind of learned of him, too. He there, There's paintings of him and shit. He um, ran with Joan of Arc way back when. Okay, well, those were the bad old days for sure. He's, he's well... Pretty well known. A lot of people think that he's misunderstood. Aren't they all, Jack? A misunderstood occultist. And then he actually didn't do what he did. But uh, I think the evidence suggests that he killed and raped many, many children uh, during his time uh, of power. And uh, Edward Paisnell, the Beast of Jersey, is actually a descendant of him. And uh, believes himself to be a second coming of that monster. Wow. Paisnell... He's um, convicted very quickly. I think it took them 30 minutes to convict him of 13 of the uh, rapes and the kidnappings. And uh, he ends up serving 10 years in England's Winchester prison. Um, It's supposed to be a 30-year sentence. He's a model prisoner, though, so he earns early release in the early 80s. And incredibly, once he's released Dead Bug, he tries to return to the island of Jersey. He just fucking shows back up 10 years later. And uh, like they did to Alphonse, they, who has returned to the island, by the way, now that he's been, you know, uh, proven not to be to be the beast. Uh, Paisnell, he's in his mid-50s and he's run off the island and lucky not to be lynched. What he'll do is he'll live up the next decade on a small uh, small island, uh, just as the once accused Alfonso Le Galastois had been. He's exiled. And uh, Edward Paisnell, the Beast of Jersey, dies in his early 60s in 91, 1991 of a heart attack. It's suspected that the periods where he was not hunting Jersey for children and women, because there were periods where he kind of, th- there wasn't much going on, he was molesting children in children's homes where he often worked as a resident handyman. So just a fucking terror, man. He was known as Uncle. I think it was Uncle Uncle Ted, they said, but it had to have been Uncle Ed. His name's Edward. Um, And he would put kids on his knee in these homes 
and molest them. And later on, adults would say, yeah, I remember being molested by that guy. And bone fragments were later found on the grounds of one of the homes that he worked at. Uh, possibly the scatterings of victims will never know the story of. Yeah. Scary. That's it, dead body. That is, that is, that is uh, one uh, dark tale and one creepy guy, too. Mm-hmm. If you look up the photos of him, whoever's listening, you can just look up the uh, Beast of Jersey. You can see what we've been talking about this whole time. Yeah, I mean, this this guy's scary on all counts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean. Wow. They'll, they'll, they don't make him like that anymore. I don't think you can get away with that kind of thing anymore. No, I, I, I still can't believe that he only got 10 years. Oh. <laughs> Being a model prisoner, right? Yeah and uh, released and allowed to go back home. And and the balls on this fucking guy to go right back to that little island where everybody knows who he was. Yeah, I mean, I, in some ways, I guess that's all he knows, though. I mean, that's a small little island. I mean, uh, this is all these people know. I mean, there probably was probably his parents were born on that island and his parents' parents were born on that island. That's all he knows. Yeah, well, they kicked him off. They kicked him off. Yeah, yeah. But just, just to another island, though, didn't they? Just another nearby little... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like a little uh, deserted-type island. Yeah, he's eating lobsters and dies of a heart attack. Oh, the uh, the guy Alphonse, I, I just want to mention, the guy Alphonse that we mentioned earlier, he ends up living to be, I think it was 97 years old. <laughs> oh, yeah. On uh, It would have been amazing if you had the means, I guess, at the time to have interviewed that guy about his experience and the whole thing and all the stories he must have heard about the entire incident, because I'm sure he would have been an expert on it, having once been accused of of being the man himself, right? Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? That's really crazy. What a crazy story. I'm shocked that I really never heard of this. You know, as Christmas is approaching, though, that's what I had heard, that this guy used to play uh, Santa Claus. For the kids, local kids. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. In the community hall. He liked to dress up. (laughs) Yeah. He's a sick fuck. So this guy was creepy on all counts. I mean, this guy was Santa Claus. That's that's scary. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well. Brother, by definition of tales from the bottom down, that one will be a a tough one to beat. You know, that's a showstop. I'm glad we ended on that one. That's a hard one to top. But uh, we're going to have to try. We'll try. We'll try. What, right now? Get the fuck out of here right now. I think we're done, right? Yeah, no, we're done right now. I can't take too much of this sort of shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm gonna go take a shower. <laughs> yeah, it's late at, late at night. This will give me fucking... This guy will give me nightmares. Anybody wants to check out this guy, there is definitely an element of this guy that they used in that movie, uh, Halloween, for sure. You'd hope... You'd not hope so. You'd think so, but and I'm sure some people listening are aware of the case, but I don't I don't really see any connection to it because I feel like the Halloween series was just kind of uh, they they discovered it. They went to a cheap fucking dollar store type place and got a William Shatner mask, melted it up, and I don't think that they they connected it. You know? Yeah, maybe you're right. And Halloween was made way before the internet, so it's not like these guys could have Googled it. I mean, I'd never even heard of this case. But thank you for sharing that one, brother. That is certainly one that we're going to have to work on topping. And we're going to have to top that. And uh, and as long as everybody's out there and wants to keep listening to these tales, we'll keep bringing them to you. Look forward to it. Me too. All right. Okay, amigo. It's time to part ways. All right. Till next time. Hombre. Adios. <laughs> Hasta la vista. And we'll see everybody else on the next episode of Tales from the Bottom Down. And remember, as I mentioned at the top of the podcast, if you like this sort of thing, go over and sign up to Patreon. For as low as a buck, baby, you get all these extras. Links are in the description. Don't be shy.